Right. <laughs> now, uh, Franklin, I can call you Franklin, and uh, because I've known for many years. I, you, you used to come to the Follies as a boy and see our show. <laughs> in fact, in fact you've come there as an old man to see it, too. <laughs> and, uh, you used to come to the Follies, and like all notables, I would ask him to get up and say something. And I would think he was going to get up and maybe say some field show. But he would get up and nominate Smith for something. <laughs> He boasted that he was just an ordinary fellow, a country boy who only knew he read in the newspaper. Yet even presidents were delighted when this man made jokes about them. And his nation came to call him its ambassador of good humor. His name is Wilgers, and this is his biography. In a decade, Will Rogers was one of the most popular men in the United States. He was not only an entertainer, but he was hugely successful as a journalist, an actor, a politician, and a wry critic of the national scene. All this achieved by a man who boasted that he had never gone beyond the fourth grade. By a man who said, I'm just an ignorant fellow schooled in the wide open spaces. Will Rogers is born in 1879 on a ranch in the heart of Indian country in what is now the state of Oklahoma. Will's grandmother is a full-blooded Indian. Young Will himself has entered in tribal records as a half-breed Cherokee, number 2340. Although he later will make much of his humble origin, the Rogers Ranch is one of the most prosperous in the territory. Clem Rogers expects his son to be more the rancher. He will to become a refined and cultured gentleman. Will prefers the life of a cowhand, roaming the open range, riding herd on his father's longhorn. In love with this life of action, Will hates anything to do with schools and book learning. Instead, Will studies the fine arts of the cowhand. He can ride with the best of them, and he becomes an expert with the lariat. In town, Will's rope tricks sometimes get him into trouble. Watch out for that Rogers boy, a neighbor warns. He'll throw a rope over anything that moves. By the time he's 17, Will has convinced his family that he'll never amount to much. When he's expelled from school for the seventh time, Clem Rogers finally admits, I can't make him learn. There's just too much mule in Willie. Finally, in 1902, Will finds the first job he really likes. He joins a Wild West show, and he enjoys every minute of it. He never quite gets over being paid so much for doing what comes naturally. After a time, Will says, it didn't seem worthwhile roping a steer unless I had an audience. Will makes a colorful new group of friends on the Wild West show circuit. One of them is a stunt rider and horse trainer named Tom Mix, soon to become one of the great silent movie cowboys. After two years, Will gets to New York, and here he discovers a new world, the wonderful world of vaudeville. He stays 
in New York after the Wild West show moves on. He's determined to break into Vaudeville with his roping act. Will is a success in his first engagement. Soon he's a headliner, earning a salary unheard of back in Oklahoma, $125 a week. By 1915, Will climbs to the top of Vaudeville. He even appears in the fabulous Ziegfeld Folly. Will has married his hometown sweetheart, Betty Blake. Now they have a young son, Will Jr. But Will is worried about his family's security. He fears that his Vaudeville career could collapse overnight. So when Will is offered a fat movie contract, he decides to go west. The Rogers family arrives in Hollywood, a bustling movie boom town, in 1919. Will winds up being cast as a slapstick comedian. Spends most of his time being pursued across the California landscape. Will Rogers enjoys his life as a movie actor. His working day ends in mid-afternoon, leaving him plenty of time for the outdoor life he loves. The Rogers family grows. Will Jr. is joined by Mary and Jimmy. Will insists that his kids graduate early from the cradle to the saddle. Then, in 1920, Will decides to take a fling at producing films on his own. He wants to be his own boss. His first films poked fun at Hollywood. He breaks all precedent by kidding his own production. In one film, Will does a takeoff on Hollywood's great lover, Rudolph Valentino. Rogers, however, is a resounding failure as a businessman. Within one year, he finds himself up to his neck in debt. Now, Will is ready to do almost anything to make some money. While his wife dodges his creditors, Will seizes on the one opportunity offered to him, to travel the country as an after-dinner speaker. He has to be ready to perform at a moment's notice. He flies all over the country to speak at political dinners and county fairs. On the lecture circuit, however, Will soon finds himself running short of material. So he starts to make a specialty of what he calls fresh laid jokes, off-the-cuff commentary on the day's news. I was uh, very fortunate. Uh, I missed part of the speeches. Uh, somebody said, Governor Roth, give me a treat. Uh, did you give me a tree? I was, uh, uh, huh? Is that so? Will you put it in writing? <laughs> and, uh, so anyhow, I, I'd like to take my, uh, leave my tree here till lumber is worth more. <laughs> At a meeting of state governors, he finds that no one likes laughing at politicians more than the politicians themselves. Will has discovered his own unique style of entertaining. The unveiling of an heroic statue of a pioneer woman is the perfect occasion for his irreverent wit. Now, now, that, the, uh, now that the applesauce and bologna is all over, and uh, we, will, we will try and state a few facts about this affair. That's a wonderful figure of the boy. That's the cleanest face I ever saw on an Oklahoma boy. That woman's got on a corset, you know, and we haven't seen one in years, but she's got one on. 
I've been, I've been to parties, I've been to, I've been to affairs with the old time woman when she, you know, at dinner parties when she couldn't see out over them, you know, <laughs> looking out like that. She's got on an old time, you know, that's wonderful. She got on an old time course, you know. Uh, the first ten years of my married life, I spent. Uh, how did we all spend it? Uh, any of us old timers, we spent it standing behind our wife doing this. <laughs> <laughs> Gradually, Will Rogers is talking himself out of debt. But he feels that he's a second rater. His failure in Hollywood nags at him. Will Rogers is sure that real fame and fortune have passed him by. After only a short time on the lecture circuit, Will Rogers finds himself in demand all across the nation. One reviewer describes his performance this way. His chewing gum is comforting, his grammar is comforting. He can turn a theater into a grocery store and make us pay $5 to sit around the Cracker Barrel. I haven't, I haven't welcomed the governors. I want to welcome them, too, because that's one thing we do in California is welcome. We'll welcome anything that'll come here. <laughs> this is the wisest, this is the wisest. <laughs> Wisest state in the world. They got, here's a state got a hundred and ten million dollars. Yeah, you know what I mean? On Hoover. Uh, you can't <laughs> yeah, they, they grabbed it off even when, they, you know, they grabbed it off when they thought the Republicans might get in. So the Republicans give them that much and they got away with it. Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, Wallace, the Democrats had to make good that much afraid they'd lose the state the next time. <laughs> Will now launches a new career. He accepts an offer to write a daily newspaper column. His humor is as fresh as the day's headlines. And he pokes fun at Democrats and Republicans alike. I'm going to peep behind the scenes, he says, and see the amount of politics that's involved in the medicine dished out to the people as pure statesmanship. Will's newspaper column gains tremendous circulation. The public loves his irreverent humor, even though it's often controversial. I'm getting to be one of those highfalutin writing fellows, Will says. The greatest paper in the world, the New York Times, is already objecting to the stuff I write. Broad fields are opening to Will Rogers. Not content with commenting on national affairs, he goes to Europe and makes a series of human travel films. In one sequence, filmed in an Irish brewery, he teases his fellow Americans suffering under prohibition. Thanks to his easy charm and ready humor, wherever Will Rogers goes, he makes friends. He frankly enjoys being a celebrity, and he delights chuckling with good coffee. Mr. Hoover, now listen, don't let him knock Mr. Hoover too much. Just let him go see some of these other countries and come back. He looks good after he's been over there, brother. Yeah, in Cairo. Oh, landed in Cairo, yeah. But didn't, didn't see the Sphinx. I had already seen Mr. Coolidge. <laughs> you have to Did you pilot a plane in China? Uh, did you know I flew with a Chinese pilot? Now, that's that's, uh, that's the last word in, in hell. Is. I know! I, I see that. They called it off. <laughs> Good you know, moment. Say, you're going you're gonna to get me here. Ah, <laughs> oh, you got it up, folks. Yeah. Let's go home. Oh, boy, it's good to get home. Will Rogers returns to Hollywood from a long trip abroad. He's amazed to be greeted by a crowd of cheering friends. In his absence, almost as a joke, They've elected him mayor of Beverly Hills. Addressing his new constituents, he sets forth his political philosophy. I don't say I'll give this old burg an honest administration, he declares, but I'll split 50-50 with you. How's that? Hollywood, Will finds, is changing. Talking pictures are causing a revolution in movie making. And no one is more suited for talking than Will Rogers. 
But Will is aware of his limitations as an actor. He insists that the characters he plays be only thinly disguised imitations of himself. The cowboy who once made his living twirling a rope in a Wild West show becomes one of the richest men in Hollywood. On the outskirts of Los Angeles, he builds a sprawling new ranch, complete with a private roping ring and a polo field. Will Rogers, the homespun cowboy, develops a passion for polo, the sport of the aristocrats. Friends who know only the affable, low-pressure humorist are amazed when Will becomes a hard-driving competitor on the playing field. When the match ends, Will slips right back into the familiar Rogers mold. Will is also fascinated by airplanes. He flies so much that normally clannish professional pilots accept him as one of them. They admiringly call him the Prime Minister of Aviation. Will Rogers now mixes with the great and the powerful the same people he makes jokes about in the papers and on the stage. And most of them consider being worked over by Will a mark of distinction. Ex-President Calvin Coolidge is the rare exception. Coolidge come into our lives at a peculiar time in our existence. He was, uh, you know, he was uh, held about every other political job there was to hold, and uh, at a time about two or three years after the war, he was just a man we needed. Didn't do nothing but back what we wanted done. <laughs> Will continues to prosper despite the depression that suddenly grips America. Laughter is one commodity the nation needs. But by 1931, it's hard even for Will to find anything funny to talk about on the national scene. It wasn't the working class that brought this condition on at all. It was the it was the big boys themselves who thought that this financial drunk we were going through was going to last forever. They over-merged and over-capitalized and over everything else. That's the fix that we're in now. 1932, an election year. Will's sympathies are with presidential candidate Franklin Roosevelt. And he knows that the best way to help FDR is to make Roosevelt a special target for his humor. We must have some 80 or 90,000 people here tonight. That's the most people that ever paid to see a politician. <laughs> here tonight, Governor, you are not allowed to refer to politics. They won't let anyone talk politics in here because they do art, sports, and uh, any uh, useful enterprises. <laughs> You're here tonight, not as candidate Roosevelt, but just as neighbor Roosevelt from the other side of the Rocky Mountains. Now, this introduction hasn't been very uh, uh, learned or very flowery, but uh, remember, you're only a candidate. <laughs> As a president, I'll do right by you. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> because I'm certainly wasting no oratory on a prospect. <laughs> Roosevelt is elected, and he immediately makes Will Rogers an ambassador for the New Deal. Will's gentle ribbing helps win public acceptance for the controversial NRA, the National Recovery Administration. This whole NRA system has got to work or else. I mean, and, and uh, or they say or else what? Well, just else. There ain't gonna be nothing if it don't work. By 1935, Will Rogers has turned back to his accustomed role the carefree, roving humorist. I was looking for Finland. <laughs> That's the greatest country there is. I saw President, I spent a kind of a business tour in a way. Mr. Roosevelt, I saw him in Honolulu, and he says, Will, I'll give you 10% of all you can collect any, in any country, you know? <laughs> and I come in, we didn't get anything, you know? <laughs> he is flying more than ever now although many of his admirers protest that air travel is too dangerous. We had enough 
clothes, got enough clothes on here. I don't think you'd need the parachute if you like. Couldn't hurt you. Don't <laughs> All right, here we go. We're off a little rock now. All right, okay. <laughs> I look like Annie Lindbergh. <laughs> go on, Randy. <laughs> All right. And go on. Go on. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> In the summer of 1935, Will and a famous racing pilot, Wiley Post, plan a long-distance flight to Russia via Alaska. They know they will encounter treacherous weather and have to fly over uncharted territory. But that's just the sort of adventure Will loves. The flight is a refreshing release for Will. His spirit soars. His newspaper columns from Alaska are filled with the excitement of new places and new people. August 15, 1935. Will and Wiley Post take off from Fairbanks, Alaska, bound for Point Barrow, northernmost city on the American continent. they are due at Point Barrow, their plane is discovered a twisted wreck. Both Wiley Post and Will Rogers are dead. Will Rogers' body is brought back to California by plane. From around the world come tributes. Says President Roosevelt, the nation will hold him in everlasting remembrance. A close friend of Will says sadly, today a smile has disappeared from the lips of America. Will Rogers once said, when I die, my epitaph is going to read, I never met a man I didn't like. I'm so proud of that, he went on that when you visit my grave, you'll probably find me sitting there admiring it. He's not only an entertainer, but he was hugely successful as a journalist, an actor, a politician, and a wry critic of the national scene. All this achieved by a man who boasted that he had never gone beyond the fourth grade. By a man who said, I'm just an ignorant fellow schooled in the wide open spaces. Will Rogers is born in 1879 on a ranch in the heart of Indian country in what is now the state of Oklahoma. Will's grandmother is a full-blooded Indian Young Will himself has entered in tribal records as a half-breed Cherokee, number 2340. Although he later will make much of his humble origin, the Rogers Ranch is one of the most prosperous in the territory. Clem Rogers expects his son to be more the rancher. He will to become a refined and cultured gentleman. Will prefers the life of a cowhand roaming the open range, riding herd on his father's longhorn. In love with this life of action, Will hates anything to do with schools and book learning. Instead, Will studies the fine arts of the cowhand. He can ride with the best of them, and he becomes an expert with the lariat. In town, Will's rope tricks sometimes get him into trouble. Watch out for that Rogers boy, a neighbor warns. He'll throw a rope over anything that moves.
By the time he's 17, Will has convinced his family that he'll never amount to much. When he's expelled from school for the seventh time, Clem Rogers finally admits, I can't make him learn. There's just too much mule in Willie. Finally, in 1902, Will finds the first job he really likes. He joins a Wild West show, and he enjoys every minute of it. He never quite gets over being paid so much for doing what comes naturally. After a time, Will says, it didn't seem worthwhile roping a steer unless I had an audience. Will makes a colorful new group of friends on the Wild West show circuit. One of them is a stunt rider and horse trainer named Tom Mix. His name is Wilgers, and this is his biography. a decade, Will Rogers was one of the most popular men in the United States. He was... Hi. <laughs> now, uh, Franklin, I can call you Franklin, and uh, because I've known for many years, I, you, you used to come to the Follies as a boy and see our show. <laughs> in fact, in fact you've come there as an old man to see it, too. <laughs> and, uh, he used to come to the Follies, and like all notables, I would ask him to get up and say something. And I would think he was going to get up and maybe say some field show. But he would get up and nominate Smith for something. <laughs> <laughs> he boasted that he was just an ordinary fellow, a country boy who only knew he read in the newspaper. Yet even presidents were delighted when this man made jokes about them. And his nation came to call him its ambassador of good humor. 